a series called Hot Love, a study through the Song of Solomon. You're probably wondering what kind of title is that for a church service? Well, let me tell you something about Hot Love. Is God designed all relationships, including the marriage relationship. He's the one that put all the components in relationships. He's the one that designed uh, intimacy. And yes, I'll say the word. He is the one that designed sex. It's it's a wonderful gift that God has given us. He's given us romance. He's given us wonderful things called marriage. And it's in the context within a marriage between a husband and a wife. It is a beautiful thing. It helps sustain life. It helps to bond people together. It helps grow strong communities, raise kids and communities and all that type of thing. And so, listen, the enemy understands that. He understands if he can get the family messed up, if he can destroy the intimate part of a person's life, then he can wreak, wreak havoc on society. The Bible says that he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Now, a lot of people think in church, well, we can't talk about that. Well, the problem was we have not been talking about it, and since we're not talking about it, everyone else is. And so we want to set the record straight. God has a lot to say about relationships. He has a lot to say about marriage. He has a lot to say about romance. And we've been going through this series. I've been having a lot of fun with it. And, you know, it's great because God made fun. Do you realize that? God designed pleasure. God designed excitement. He is the maker of all good things. But the enemy comes to kill, to lie, and to destroy. And so we're going to set it in the right way. That's what we've been doing, a hot love, a journey through the Song of Solomon. And today, title is Loving Out of Conflict. Has anyone got any conflict happening on the way to church here this morning? Do not raise your hand. <laughs> I will tell you, growing up, mom and dad, if you're watching, which you probably are, they're in Florida, 86 degrees. I just left them. We were there for a little bit, visiting them at a wonderful time. Great to be back, everybody. But I have to be honest, when I got out of the plane, I was like, Jesus sent me back. Um, <laughs> but better, anyhow, I was saying, but, you know, a conflict is going to happen in any relationship. And we need to learn how to deal with conflict. And today we're going to talk about conflict. All right, so let's move forward. This is the theme verse of the entire um, series we're talking about here is this. And this is a description of a passionate, loving relationship that God wants every couple to have that's married. And it's this. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This is Solomon who wrote 105 different psalms. This is considered his chief work in as far as beauty and things of that nature. So let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. In other words, you are intoxicating. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, the virgins love it. She's talking about her husband. That Listen, no one comes close to you. Everyone loves you. The way you conduct your life, you are beautiful. I mean, talk about how would you like your spouse to talk that way about you. She's just, she's just honoring her husband, and, and, and they're honoring each other. It's a great, great thing that they're doing. And this is the way a relationship should be. It doesn't have to just start that way. I remember being at a restaurant or lunch one time, a friend of mine, we were sitting there just talking, and there was this couple like this all over each other. I said, they must not be married. I said, what? I said, that shouldn't be that way. They should be married. You know, we should always be in love. And we'll be talking about that today. And I also recognize this could be painful for some of you that have been through divorce or perhaps you're single. This is for everybody. Why? Because we're in all of this together, which you'll see in a little bit. So, first one week, we talk about how to be attractive. Want to learn how to be attractive? Go to cornerstonecheshire.com. We teach you how to be attractive. That's week one. There's eight chapters in this book of Song of Solomon. They learn how to be attractive. What makes you attractive? The law of attraction. Then we talk about dating, the reasons and seasons of dating. And I will tell you hands down that the way society is doing it is wrong. It does not work. Since the 1920s, there has been a rewriting of how we date and relate to each other. And it has been disastrous. And so we talk about what the Bible says about godly dating. And how you're supposed to do it in the right way. So I encourage you, for those of you who are single, have not been here, those that are in a youth retreat, guys, I encourage you to go back and listen to this. A lot of it was in personal experience and the word of God, dating and relating. That was week two. They started dating each other. Then they got married. And then we came to Lionel Richie's all night long intimacy. All right, they had a good time. And we talk about the bedroom chamber and intimacy. God designed love making in the context of marriage. It's something that's wonderful and should be celebrated in the privacy of a husband and wife's bedroom, not everywhere else. 
And the enemy understands this. We don't need to hear about this in locker rooms or on chats or on Tumblrs or on Instagrams or whatever Snapchat or whatever people are on these days or letting something tomorrow, I'm sure. But we should be discussing this in church. Why? Because it's so important. And God made it. All we heard from church is don't, 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 no, no, no. And God says yes. God says yes to these things in its proper context. We mentioned the fact that, that sex and all that is like fire in a fireplace. Awesome. In the engine of an automobile, combustible engine, will get, but fire out of its context is deadly, destroys lives, has collateral damage that's incredible. And so that's why we need to take this fire that God has given us and celebrate it in its proper force, fashion. Let me tell you, God has good plans. Let me tell you, it is a wonderful thing. It's not a dirty thing in the right context. And so this is important to listen to. I know last week was about PG, maybe PG-13. Last time I was here. Today we're talking about conflict. So we're going to listen to this one. Conflict. How to deal with conflict. Conflict, conflicting. You're going opposite of I'm going. They often say that uh, opposites attract and then they attack. And so what, what drew you to your spouse? Wow, she's different than me. And now you're saying, she's different from me, right? So we're talking about conflict. How to deal with conflict. And let me tell you right now, if you try to avoid conflict, you'll have more conflict. Conflict is a way of life. You cannot stop it from happening. So let's learn to deal with it in the right way. Conflict can make you better. Inventions such as air conditioning and heating came from conflict. I'm conflicted. I'm cold. Let's build a heater. Listen, conflict can be a good thing. It helps us to learn to be better. So instead of trying to avoid it, let's embrace it. Let's learn from it. Today, we're going to talk about how to, health, how to do it healthy way. Then in the next two weeks, we'll talk about deepening our relationships. So let's get right to today. They're in a, they're in a situation here. Excuse me. It's a little dry in here. And <clears throat> they're in a situation, and I'll go ahead and read it to you. This is now her talking. This is after the wedding night. This is after all the fireworks are done. Now real life is settled in. She said this, I slept, this is her, I slept, but my heart was awake. What is going on here? I'll tell you what's going on right here. What's going on right now is that they are having their first fight. He's supposed to be home, and he's not. I slept, but my heart was awake. Let me just say right now, all couples will fight. It's going to happen. Well, if you try to avoid fights, you'll have more fights. In fact, Sandra and I fight. We just fought the other day. I had Sandra on her hands and knees saying, come out and fight like a man. <laughs> Thank you. I, bad delivery. All right, I'll go back to my day job. Uh, all relationships have conflict. The question is, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with conflict? Before you get in a boxing ring, you have to learn how to fight. When my wife and I, Sandra, were going to premarital counseling, they taught us how to fight. I said, what? The counselor said, we need to teach you how to fight. We don't fight, we're in love. Oh, you're going to fight, believe me. We need to teach you how to fight. And they actually spent a couple of weeks with us giving us ground rules. You get in a ring of box. They have, you don't punch below the belt. You have rounds, you have a bell. Right? You, you do things in the right way, and you're going to have fights. But you need to fight right. And so today we're going to help you get your fight back in the right way. All right, everybody? So let's go to this. I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking open to me. And then she's saying, I slept and my heart was awake, so he has not been home. I don't know where he is. Supposed to be home at 5 o'clock, help the kids with the homework, eat dinner, do the dishes, and put the kids to bed. And it's 10 o'clock, and he's not home yet. I'm going to bed. He ain't getting none of this. So, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking. He's like, hey, sweetie, why don't you lock the door? Hey, I'm home. God knows what time it is, right? 10 o'clock at night, who knows? Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. You're a hot baby, I want you. Basically, he's, kind of, he's moving the smooth on her, okay? My head is drenched with dew from playing softball. I don't know what, that? I don't know what that's from. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of night. And he's smelling like the earth. Hey, baby, I'm home. And she's not answering, right? And what she had to say. She said, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I have washed my feet. Must I soil them again? In other words, she's in bed. And that's Hebrew for I have a headache. 
So, so he's kind of like, uh, uh, huh? So he's disappointed. He's disappointed. So what happens then? Well, he disappears. He just says, I'm out of here. Okay, this woman's not going to show me respect. I'm out of here. So this is what she says about her husband. My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. Now, I read this. I'm trying to figure out what on earth happened here. Some commentators said he punched the door down. It must have been an Italian uh, uh, interpreter. I'm, my, I'm Italian. I can say that. My beloved thrust his hand through. Other people say he just put his hand gently through the door. Others say he unlatched it. We don't know, but let's just say he wasn't happy, okay? So my beloved thrust his hand through the door, the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. In other words, she changed her mind. Okay. I arose to open my beloved for my beloved, and my hands were dripping with myrrh. She's like, okay, I'll smell good for him. She goes, her hands are dripping with myrrh. My fingers flowing of myrrh on the handles of the bolt. She, she's like, okay, I'm coming in. What happens? I open it for my beloved. But my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank as his dinner was sitting on the counter. No. <laughs> my heart sank at his departure. I looked for him but did not find him. I called him but he did not answer. All right, we got the silent treatment going on here, huh? Well, what's going on here? What's going on in a relationship? And we're going to look at some stages in relationships. We all face this. not in your notes. If you're taking notes, it's in your bulletin, and you can get a pen right before you. I encourage you to do that. Um, I add extra things. It's not in your notes, but there's more I'm going to be talking about. But we have stages of a relationship. There are stages in any relationship, for that matter, especially in marriage. And the first one we're going to look at is called the honeymoon. What's that? Honey. I looked it up. Honey means sweet. Moon means month. So 29.5 days is the month with a moon cycle. So he's saying, you know, basically saying a honeymoon is a sweet month. After you're married a month, you're like, okay, it ain't so sweet anymore. And so what happens is the honeymoon wears off. The honeymoon is when you're like intoxicated. I remember uh, doing some premarital counseling and talking to somebody, well, how do you guys fight? I do a section on fighting before we married somebody. Oh, we don't fight. Excuse me? What you talking about, Willis, as they used to say? We don't fight. Well, you don't fight. No, we don't fight. Well, a couple years went by. Pastor, can we see you? What's the problem? We fight. <laughs> okay. So, honeymoon, all right? He's beautiful. Remember we said opposites attract, and then they get married, and the honeymoon's over, and then they attack. So now they're finding that he doesn't smell so good. She doesn't do everything she said she was going to do. So the honeymoon phase comes into the next stage, which is called disillusionment. That's right. Disillusionment. And this is what begins to happen. And what happens is now your illusion is, is now disrobed. This is not what I thought I married. This is a, this, you had an illusion. This is the illusion of relationships. He's perfect. No, he's not. No, he's not perfect. She's perfect. No, she's not. Everybody is flawed. Even the people on the magazine covers are flawed. That's called Photoshop and airbrush. Everyone is flawed. No one is perfect. Listen, I, I've had the opportunity, and I'm not trying to, to name drop. I'm not going to mention any names, but I've met some leaders, some well household leaders. I, had an, I worked for a mega church for a period of time, and I took care of some guests. And let me try what I found out about people. Everyone is human. There's not one that's perfect. Even Billy Graham is human. You spend some time with Billy Graham, you go, man, he's, that's him? No matter who you think is the greatest thing that ever happened, they're human beings, everybody. They're going to disappoint you. And the illusion is that your spouse can meet all your needs. There's only one that can meet all your needs. It begins with a G and ends with a D. It's called God. He's the only perfect one. And so we have to get rid of this illusion that everyone's perfect. No one's perfect. doesn't give us a license to be, to be sloppy. But this is what happens. Honeymoon, then we have disillusionment. A lot of people never get past this. Some people resign themselves. I'm done with this marriage. I'll live with him, but he ain't, you know, that's it. We're going to be roommates. Or I'm out of here. I'll find somebody else. But you know what helps us through this disillusionment? It's called commitment. Commitment is, I don't care what comes. I said till death do, does us part. I will love this woman till I die. My wife and I, we don't use the D word. Not D-A-M, but we don't use the other word. D, and then it's a horse. I don't even say it. D -d -d we don't say it. That is off the option. Now, murder may not be off the option, but 
The first service laughed at that. Okay. So we don't use that word. We don't use the D word. All right? We have a commitment. We're going to work this thing through. And, and so that's what we're going to talk about here is this. And I'm going to share with you some things that a normal person would say that's impossible. And I'm going to share some other things with you today is I, I want to say this. I don't care what your past has been. Jesus can help heal your past. You see, let, let me say something right now about conflict and about marriage. If you're constantly living what he or she did, there's no hope for your marriage. Why? You can't go on a time machine. You can't change the past. The past is the past. you got to deal with the past, learn from the past, and move on. But you can't constantly bring up the past. Jesus gives us a clean slate. And so that's one of the ways we, we work with, with conflict is leaving the past behind. So we have commitment and how we're going to do that. We're going to talk about things that are impossible for you to humanly do. But through Jesus Christ and the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome relation, relationship strongholds and move on to healthy relationships. And this is what we're talking about today. And one of the things we have to learn is this. Choices lead, feelings follow. Let me say that again. Choices lead, feelings follow. You know what our culture teaches us? Feelings lead, choices follow. Truth today is relative. Well, I feel truth is this. No, there's something called truth. So we have to make choices lead, feelings have to follow. But choices, I'm married to this woman. I'm going to love this woman for all my days. You have to make a choice. And so what happens is this. I'm going to make some pre-fight decisions in all my relationships. You have to make a decision before you come into conflict. When you're in conflict, it's too late. What's going to happen in conflict? You're going to listen to the loudest voice. What's the loudest voice in conflict? Your emotions. Your emotions are powerful, folks. They're very, very powerful. And you can't, you know, you're like this. That's emotions. A commitment is a straight line. And so what we have to do is have pre-fight decisions. I'm never going to strike the woman. I'm never going to hit the woman. Maybe some of you, your spouse is hitting you. You need to get out. Not get divorced, but get out. No one deserves to be hit in a marriage. You get what you tolerate. I'm not suggesting divorce, but you need to walk out and say, we're going to go for counseling or I'm not coming back home because that's unacceptable. You know, and, and also, we have to make a pre-decision. We're not going to use a D word. We're not going to swear at each other. We're not going to do various things. We're not going to be yelling. And that's just a tough one, especially if you're ethnic like me, okay? I'm going to make a pre-fight decisions in all relationships. Pre-fight decisions with your employees. If you have employees, if I, my employee gets upset, this is how I deal with my employee. If my employer, I'm upset with him or her in the workplace, in the break room. Oh, he's such a jerk, the boss. And, you know, I made a pre-fight decision. I'm not going to participate in gossip. I'm walking out. Unless you make the pre-fight decisions, you will give in to your emotions, and you'll be a victim and puppeteered by your emotions. And my friends, your emotions are unstable. All of our emotions are unstable. We have to rein them in by our choices. And I like this. We make our decisions, and our decisions make us. So pre Fight decisions. For those that are dating, you make a decision. We're not going to be messing around before we get married. Don't wait until the, 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 the windows steam up. No, you, you do it before. You make a decision. We're not going to do this. Otherwise, I don't know what happened. I just, you know, yeah. You need to make a pre-fight decision. And in fights, you have to make a decision. This is what we're going to do in conflict. We're not going to yell. We're not going to scream. We're not going to hit each other. Okay. We're not going to say derogatory comments about each other. I'm not going to badmouth my spouse to all my friends. I'm not going to embarrass my, my husband in a, in a social gathering and demean him or demean her with jokes. Oh, you know, she burned a dinner. <laughs> Go home. You'll see what happens then, my friends. All right. We make our decisions, and our decisions make us. So what we're going to look at here is how we work through relationships. And look what happens here. Where has your lover gone, O woman of rare beauty? Now, this is something else that has happened. There's three audiences, three people that are talking in the Song of Solomon. One is Solomon, who talks very little. The wife talks a lot more. And then we have a chorus of friends. And so understand that the chorus of friends have an influence on your relationships. Who's your chorus of friends? 
Where has your lover gone, O woman of rare beauty? Which way did he turn so we can help you find him? Are you calling your girlfriend saying, what's going on? Ah, uh, he did, I, you know, you should just lead the bomb. There's some other one. I have a friend of mine you need to lead, to, to, to learn from. Well, my, I like my friend. I grew up with her. Yeah? What marriage is she on? She's on marriage six. Well, you think maybe, listen, there's grace for people that have made mistakes in relationships. And I'm not saying she's a bad person. But in the area of marriage, you might want to talk to someone that's been married 58 years like my parents. Mom and dad have been married 58 years. They had to deal with a crazy son like me. <laughs> they had to deal with health and sickness and ups and downs and business and all kinds of stuff. And, and they walked it through. They're committed to each other. That's someone I'm going to talk to when there's a problem. I'm not going to talk to, to Louis with the, with the you know, Corvette and hair on his chest with a chain that's on eight women now. I'm going to talk to Louis. What does Louis know? Fooey on Louis, all right? <laughs> talk to someone that knows what they're talking about. So who you hang out with influences you. You know what... Um, Jimmy Evans says, the, the marriage counselor, this is what he says. Divorce is a communicable disease, which means it, and, and by the way, this, the studies show if you hang out with divorced people, guess what happens? People that hang out with divorced people, they end up getting divorces. Don't underestimate the power of the influence of the crowd of people you are around. Birds of a feather flock together. That happens in Hezekiah 3.17. There's no such thing. But do not be involved with unwholesome company. The Bible says do not hang out with an angry man lest you become angry. So listen to me. Who are you hanging out with? What are you listening to? Who's the first person you talk to when there's a problem? You should just leave the man. No. You need to talk to someone and say the truth. Listen, you made a commitment. You're going to work this out. I believe you. Let me pray with you. Let me come over. My hus let my husband and I come over. Let my wife and I come over and pray for you. Okay? That's why it's important to be in groups. That we should encourage each other in our marriages. And when you're, you know, someone starts bad-mouthing, say, hey, don't talk that way about your spouse. Correct each other in love. That's why you need that group, folks. We're not called to do this by ourselves. Are you in a group? Do you have anyone that keeps you accountable in your relationships? Are you hanging out with people that have roughy, rough relationships? Hang out with healthy people. When you're healthy enough, then you can help those that are not healthy. But if you find yourself being pulled the wrong direction, it's time to sever that relationship and find people that will influence you in the proper way. This is extremely important. I think some of you, this will be a life changer and a marriage saver. Stop hanging out with that person telling you wrong advice. You're just a man. No, you're not an animal. You're made in the image of God. So, where has your lover gone, a woman of rare beauty? Which way did he turn so we can help you find him? I couldn't find her. She's, I know where he is. My lover has gone down to his garden, to his spice beds, to browse in the gardens and gather the lilies. Sounds like a florist. He's not a florist, okay? But what's happened is, apparently, uh, he knows where to go when he's upset. He, he, he retreated himself, and he went to a place of solitude to collect his thoughts. You know what a good thing to do when you're frustrated is walk away for a bit and collect your thoughts. Go before God. What is he doing? I am, what does she say? I am my lover's, and my lover is mine. He browses among the lilies. I know where my husband is. He's getting right with God. He's getting right with God. You know, I, I, you know, I, I have to be truthful with you here this morning. I, I'm not perfect. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> but I, I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes in my relationships, and my wife and I, and I can be quick with the tongue, and I can slice and dice pretty fair and pretty quick. And I'm not proud of that fact. It's something I have to get a control of. You know, whatever, what, what you're blessed with can be used against you. And so, you know, that's part of it. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we change? Well, we have to act, not react. What does that mean? Well, what's a react? You're reacting what was been done to you. So, boy, you're home late. What do you mean I'm home late? Stop yelling at me. That's not yelling. This is yelling. You know, that, that's, that's an example that's an example of what can happen. That, that you see how you, you throw the ball and it just starts snowballing and the next thing you know there's a big blow up? That's called reacting. You don't want to react. You want to act. In other words, premeditated decision. When we come home and we're upset, we're going to ramp it down. Listen, I, I wish I could say I was perfect on this and I tell you, I was convicted. And Conviction means you realize you need to work on something and God gives you the grace to work on it. That's true biblical conviction, not condemnation. But I love what 1 Peter says about Jesus. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. 
What's the first thing you and I want to do when we're insulted? All you have to do is turn on the news. See how someone says something against the president, the president retaliates, and they say something about him, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is like third grade, right? This is terrible. The political, if you want to learn how to fight, please don't watch politics. I mean, they're acting like babies, all of them. That's the wrong way to do it. It does get ratings, though. But nevertheless, that's not important. <laughs> okay. No commentary. Okay. I will act and not react. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge. Well, you did that to me. I'm going to get you back. It's almost like spy versus spy in Mag Magazine. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, you do that to me, I'll do this. You ramp it up, you ramp it up. I got to win. Yeah, you can win the argument and lose the marriage. It's not worth it. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threat revenge when he suffered. What did he do? He left his case in the hands of God. Doesn't mean you walk around, okay, honey, go ahead. No, it means he brought it before God. Are you bringing your conflict before God? You know what the Bible has to say? This is what it says. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you, if you want to help a, a situation, then, then, then ramp it down. Don't ramp it up. And sometimes this can happen in a relationship where, you know, it, it comes to the point where, you know, they give you the, the cold treatment. You know what that is, the cold treatment? Well, you get in an argument, and you go to bed at night, and you're going to talk. First person that talks loses. So I'm going to bed. <laughs> For those of you that have a king size bed, you have an advantage about this. I have a queen size, so we still can touch accidentally. So anyhow, I can just, you know, the king size, you have a different zip code. It's pretty nice. Okay, but I have... If you want to buy me king size, I'm all for it. Okay, here we go. Let's go back to what we're talking about. So we go to bed angry on my back. I give her my back. She gives me her back, and I'm going to talk to her. I'm going to touch that woman. And if she touches my toe, hey, you can't have any of this. She's like, do I really want that? Okay. <laughs> so not a real big punishment. Get, don't you touch my toe. It actually reminds me of a story of a man that, and a wife that got in an argument, and they were really upset, and they weren't talking. You know, the old rule, whoever talks first loses. So he goes to bed. He wakes up in the morning. Oh, my gosh, it's 8 o'clock. I had to be at the airport at 6. He's really upset. And he, and he, he runs. Her, why didn't you wake me up? You should have wake me up. And, 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 and why, why didn't you do that? She goes, she goes, she brings him to it. She doesn't say anything. She brings him to the pillow and points to the pillow. He picks up a note. Wake up, it's 5 a.m. <laughs> Help us, Jesus, right? God, we need help. We do. All of us need help. I, 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 don't, I don't stand here this morning as, wow, I'm, I'm Mr. Solve it all. No, I'm not. I can, I'll just be transparent with that. I'm the kind of guy that can, <clears throat> I'll blow up quickly, and then I'll, then I'll say, oh, I'm sorry about that. Meanwhile, you know, people say, well, I just blow up and it's over with. That's what terrorists do. They blow up and it's all over with. Yeah, that's what can happen. Words matter. Actions matter. Well, how do you deal with it? Well, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Does it not, everybody? All you have to do, they've done studies. You yell at someone, and your adrenaline goes right up. And then you want to fire back or give the cold shoulder. And what does he do? You are beautiful as Tizar. I don't know what Tizar is, but it sounds nice, right? My love. Sounds like a nice fragrance. Tizar. Okay. Lovely as Jerusalem. Awesome as an army with banners. I mean, that's a male way. Honey, you look like an army of banners. She's like, I'll take it. <laughs> At least he called me Tizar. All right. So he's, what is he doing? He's sweet talking her, isn't he? All right. I will act and not react. Why? My dove, my perfect one, is the only one. He's now sweet, he's talking nice. The only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines also, and they praised her. He's just talking nicer. Why is he doing that for? Why? I will focus on good and not bad. Truth is, you can focus, all of us have liabilities. And we do. We have good things and bad things. What are you going to focus on? I'm not going to use the... The adage, half full, half empty, even though I just used it. But which way are you going to look at? You look at the deficit or look what's great? You know what happens often? We often look at the 20% in the relationships we don't like and forget the 80. And there are people that get divorces over 
for someone else that has a 20%. Then they marry that 20% and they lost to 80%. The truth is, you're, no one is perfect. We all have liabilities. And so I will focus on the good, not the bad. The Bible says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever lovely, think on these things. Whatever you celebrate and talk about, you multiply. You're no good. You're always, you start doing that, you know what happens? It makes the person go up higher. You're not being faithful to me. You're always cheating. You talk that to your husband. He's going to think, maybe I should cheat. Don't talk that way. Don't say that to your wife either. Well, you're no good. You're probably out with your friends. No, talk life to each other. Speak life. There's power in the tongue, power to kill. God spoke the universe with his tongue. We need to be careful with our tongue. And so what do you do? Focus on what's good. Remember the good things about her. Remember the good things about him. I can't remember a thing. That's true. I'll tell you what happens. When you're angry, you can't remember one good thing about somebody. Am I not right about that? I mean, you have amnesia. Like, all you know is that incident. Boom, I'm getting along. And we, we know we want to fight. We want to make ourselves right. So whatever's true, whatever's noble, think on these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And what happens here? This saved a little time. He went down to the nut orchard, to look at the blossoms, there he is again, of the valley, to see whether the vines had budded. Now time has passed by. Whether the pomegranates were in bloom, so a season has passed, right? Before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsmen and prince. They began to make up. So I will act and not react. I will focus on the good and not the bad. It reminds me of a story of Ruth Graham. Ruth Graham is Billy Graham's wife. And someone said to her, well, your husband's gone a lot, isn't he? He's gone and gone a lot. He's gone down 17 weeks a year. He's gone a long time. How do you feel about that? Well, you know, when he's home for five months, well, Billy home at five months is better than any man at 12 months. She focused on the good, not the bad. Focus on what brought you this. I, number three, I will return to do what built the first love. I'll return to do what built the first love. Jesus talks about this in the book of Revelation. Listen, there's a lot we can learn about Christ in the church. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Wives, see that you respect your husbands. There's a love and respect here, which is a whole other lesson. Great book to buy called Love and Respect. It talks about that whole thing. But I had this complaint against you, Jesus says. You don't love me or each other. Now, look at that. You don't love me or each other. Jesus always ties how we treat him and how we treat each other. How you treat somebody else is how you treat God. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. How can you say that? Jesus just said it. And also it says, if you hate your brother whom you do see, 1 John, you cannot love God who you do not see. You want to know how you're treating God? How you treat your spouse. There's nothing greater. The best mirror for me in my relationship with Christ is how I treat my wife. If I'm neglecting my wife, I'm neglecting God. I'll, I'll tell you right now, it is the best mirror that I know of to see where I am with God. You want to see how I'm doing with God? Ask me how I'm doing with Sandra, and that will tell you how I'm doing with God. I can't separate the two, folks. At least that's the way for me. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back and do the work she did at first. In other words, what got you in love will keep you in love. But we forget about it. Ladies, remember, you, you were going to meet him, and you have like a, a 20 outfits on the bed you've been trying on, and you've been going to the store, you've been trying to find what looks good, and you spent hours on your hair. Now you have cucumbers in your eyes, and you have rollers. Do they still do rollers anymore? I don't know. And he get, get, gets the worst of you. Or guys, you just come home, whatever. Oh, hi, honey, I'm home. No, I mean, come on, let's, let's have some pride. Let's, let's try to attract each other. Let's try to, f listen, you need to start flirting with each other. That brings romance. Yeah, I have to be honest. I, I'm sorry to embarrass you, but I get a little shy around my wife sometimes. Love it. You know, we love each other. And this series has been good for us, praise God. You know, and it is. It's helped me to reevaluate my relationship. Because I haven't got there yet. But you know, when we spend time together, we spend, we show respect to each other, that love comes back. And then you start, instead of flirting with all the girls at work, and well, I'm still got, I'd rather have it with my wife than any other girl. Who cares about the other girls? Right? Ladies, why do you need compliments from other guys? Listen, focus all your energy on your spouse. 
Try to date her again. What brought you together will keep you together. If you don't, I will come and remove the lampstand. So I will return to do what built the first love. Oh, how beautiful you are. How pleasing, my love. How full of delights. He is returning and complimenting her. You know what happens? It's what you need to do. The best way to stay out of court is to court each other. That was my own. I'm pretty proud of that one. Toward of that, won't you? I just lost my inheritance in heaven. <laughs> the best way to stay out of court is to court each other. Can we do that, everybody? We have something once a month right here at Cornerstone Church called Marriage Workshop. Cynthia and Coleman do an amazing job with Mike House. What they do, they, they give you a, a free night of date. You can come here. Kids will be watched after. Do a little marriage tune-up, and you go out with your wife or your spouse. We're trying to make it. We're trying to help, right? Work on your romance. And, and this is how you know your romance is done. You go out to eat with your, your, your wife and you talk about the kids the whole time. That's okay. Get the kids out of the way. Talk about work. You know. Then start getting romantic with her. Think how, you can, think how you can capture her. Well, I already captured her. No, you haven't. You have to capture her every day. My parents, they're watching. They're a good role model for me. They still, they still go after each other. It's a beautiful thing. They still romance each other. They're not perfect, but I know they love each other. And I can say with all confidence, I love Sandra now more than I did the first day I met her or the first when we got married. I love her more now than I ever had before. She's the most godly, most wonderful woman I could ever ask for. She's got a heart of gold. She's beautiful in and out. And I'm a blessed man. And I want to invest in that. I'm going to have rewards later from that. Okay. The best way to say... <laughs> those are ulterior motive. Okay. <laughs> the best... Sorry. The best way to stay out of court is to court each other, everybody. That's how we need to keep it going. Don't give up on your, you don't give up on your car. You don't give up on your house. Why do we give up on our spouse? It takes work. Yeah, it takes work. But it, dividends are awesome. So I will act, not react. I will focus on good and not the bad. I will return to do what it built the first love. And I will talk and not walk. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. We have, a, we have a society today that doesn't believe in commitment. If I don't like it, my happiness is the most important thing. I'm not happy, so I'm leaving. I heard that so many times. Why are you getting divorced? I'm not happy. Well, I'm not happy sometimes. It doesn't mean you leave somebody because you're not happy. Right? I'm not happy. It's not about being happy. It's about being holy. Let me say that again. Our objective in life is something wrong with America. Let me say it. It's in our Constitution, Bill of Rights and Constitution. What is it called? The pursuit of what? No, there's something flawed in that. What's happiness? Happenstance. What happens to me controls me. The pursuit of happiness will kill a marriage. The pursuit of holiness will bring you wholeness. Folks, we got to stop using that, that happiness nonsense and start looking for wholeness instead. Holiness. God wants us to be holy. I will talk. I will not walk. I will not use that D word. I love my wife. And I'm not going to sabotage it all just to have a little fun. I'm not going to sabotage it to find someone else and start all over. Why? She's my wife. I'm going to love her. Premeditated commitment. And I hang out with people that ask me, how you doing with your wife? How are your eyes doing? How's your thought life? Because you know what? That happens. You got to be careful, my friends. There's a major, it's so hard today. The Bible says be angry. It's okay to be angry. Sometimes, you know what? He does things, you should be angry. She does things, you should be angry. Okay? But do not sin. Anger does not give you a right to sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil, that you invite the devil in your house. I will tell you, this has happened to us, and it's happened to me, where all of a sudden we start, the tension level rises in the house. I mean, there's something demonic in this house, and it's you. <laughs> and so I just say, Lord Jesus, right now we take authority over this house. I declare the peace of Christ. I command the enemy to leave. I love my wife. And there's something I learned very, very important. This is a pre-fight decision. Your mate is not your enemy. 
The devil's your enemy, not your mate. So make that. So take authority over it. I will not give an opportunity to the devil. Now, we've, I used to try to do this legalistically. We're not going to go to bed till we settle this. Well, the problem is I'm exhausted. She's exhausted. Our emotions are spent. We have no ability to deal with anything. The best thing we can do is to go to sleep. So we, we have a little pass that we have made up. It's, it's imaginative, but it's a pass. I love you. You love me. Let's deal with it in the morning. And we've done that sometimes. And we, we just say, let's deal with it in the morning. And I wake up the next morning. I'm like, what was I upset about? I can't even remember. Sometimes you're just tired. But... Don't let a day go by without settling an issue or it will turn to something worse. For example, if you have a bowl of cornflakes, I've done this. I don't feel like doing the dishes right now. I'll put them in the dish, on the sink. The next morning I get up, I need a hacksaw to get that thing off, right? When it first takes place, you get a little warm water and it, off it comes. If you don't deal with your stuff, it gets like cement on your spirit and your relationship. Get out of your past and get into your future by letting Jesus take your past. But anyone who does not love does not know God. Do you love your spouse? No, you don't love God. What? I'm sorry, how can you say that? Well. But anyone who does not love does not know God. She's unlovable. So are you, my friend. I'm unlovable. I'm a wreck without God. I'd hate to be me without God. You would not like me without God. Believe me, I'm a wreck without God. I need God. And you need God in your relationships. If you don't love your spouse, you don't love God. You cannot dissect how you treat other people from God. It's impossible. Why? The Bible says so. You have to love your spouse. What's love? 1 Corinthians 13. Keeps no record of wrongs, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. God's not impressed. Anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is what? He's love. God showed how much he loved us by what? Sending us his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not the stuff you read about in books and magazines and what you see in our society. This is real love. Not that we love God. So he didn't wait for us to get their act together. No, but that he loved us and what? Sent his son as a sacrifice, what? To take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Are we loving each other? Well, he doesn't deserve it. Well, neither do you. Now, I'm not suggesting you become a doormat. I'm not suggesting you suffer abuse. But the truth of the matter is, if you and I got what we deserve, you know what we would deserve right now? You may, may offend a, a few of you, I'm sorry. If we got what we deserve right now, we should be marched out of here, lined up on the back wall, and shot. That's what you and I deserve, death. Pastor, how can you say that? <laughs> I just said it, <laughs> okay. We're imperfect. We're wretched without God. We need God. Thank God I don't get what I deserve. I get his grace. How about we extend the grace to somebody else? I will act and not react. I will focus on good and not the bad. I will return to do what built the first love, and I will talk and not walk. So now, Jesus says this, I'm giving a new commandment. Love each other as I've loved you. You should love each other. How would you be with Jesus if he treated you like you treat others? Let me put it another way. How would you be with Jesus if he chose, he, he, excuse me, he treated you like you treat your wife or you treat your husband? What kind of shape would you be in? Not very good, my friends. It's time to get it right. Come on, let's be supernatural. Forget the world's ways. It doesn't work. This way it works. God loves us and has a way for us. 
And so what I'm encourage you to do today is I'm going to ask you in a few moments, let's just, let's just bow our heads for a moment. I'm going to pray a prayer. Some of you have walked away from God. You're not following God anymore. You've given up on God, but God has not given up on you. How do you know that? You're here today. If you have any pull towards God, that means God's at work in you. I need to get right with God. Well, that's God speaking to you. Maybe some of you have walked away and you're not living the life anymore. Maybe some of you have never given your life to Jesus. I always want to give an opportunity for people to do that in a comfortable place. And so if you'd like to give your life to Jesus today, you say, Pastor, I realize that I have not walked with God and I want to. I want to give my life. No more religion. I want to follow God. Or maybe you say, I've, I've walked away. I'm not living the life and I want to get right with God. Just so I know how to pray with you, in the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand real big and bold. I'm not gonna embarrass you, just wanna see. One, two, three, let's raise your hands, come on. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, several of you. And some of you watching right now, go ahead and click that on there. Come on, let's make a commitment. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I did not deserve such love. But while I was still messing up, you decided to love me. I receive your love today. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. Maybe you want to confess right now some things that are heavy in your heart. Just go ahead and confess it to him right now. Lord, I give you. I give you my past. I give you whatever it is. Lord Jesus, I thank you that what you did is enough. I receive your forgiveness in Jesus' name. And I ask you to give me the power to walk with you from this day forward. You raise your eyes real quick to me, if you could. In, in the front of your seat, there's a connection card or in your worship guide. In the front, it says here, Kevin showed you this bit earlier. It says, my decision today, I'm committing my life to Christ or I'm renewing commitment. Can you make a, can you make a bold stand on that? We're going to help you through this process. And I want to conclude our time today with something that's the most powerful thing that ever was. It's the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm going to ask the ushers to make their way down. Right now, I can't think of a better way to conclude a sermon on relationships and conflict than communion. L let me say a couple things as they pass out the elements. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians, let a man or a woman examine themselves before they take communion. That they rightly, rightly handle the body of Christ. He's not talking about the bread and the grape juice. Guess who the body of Christ is? Your brother, your sister. Okay. How you treat each other is how you treat God. If you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. If you say you love God and hate your spouse, you don't love God. We have to forgive as God's forgiven us. The good news is, you didn't get what you deserved, neither did I. But Jesus, on the night he was, before he was betrayed, sat down at a table with 12 disciples. He broke the bread and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Some of you have broken relationships. Some of you have not told your spouse you have loved them or loved her. There's no excuse. I don't love her. Well, love is a decision, not a feeling. Let me say that again. Love is a decision and not a feeling. Feelings follow. Decisions must lead. You want to love God? Love your spouse. Forgive your spouse. Jesus says, the Bible says, anyone that takes communion on an unworthy manner, drinks judgment on ourselves. If you're not willing to forgive your spouse or somebody else, do me a favor, do yourself, don't take this, because you're mocking Jesus. Because you don't deserve it, and I don't deserve it, and he gave it to us anyhow. This, my friends, is the big reset button for you and God and your relationships. This is my body, which has been broken for you. All take, eat. And after... They sup. Jesus said this is a new covenant, a new way of doing things. It's by his blood that we are healed. 
by his blood that we are forgiven. So Father, in Jesus' name, we hold this up to you as we would to toast. Father, we say we receive your forgiveness and we choose to forgive others despite how we feel. We will live by faith and not feeling. We will make a decision to follow you. We forgive everyone that has done wrong against us in faith. And we receive healing in Jesus' name. All take and drink. As we're doing that, I want to encourage you today, right after this service at 1230, 15 minutes from now, 18 minutes from now, we're going to have a class. It's called Growth Trap, Step 2, Connect. We're going to show you how to get connected, to find the right groups of people to hang out with. We'll talk about the church, what our church believes, what our vision is, where we're going, our history. We have extra tables set up, we have extra food, we have child care provided. Right after the service, on your right hand side, Grove Track Step 2, I'll be teaching the class. I'll be sharing my personal testimony, the testimony of this church. You are invited to come, drop your kids off, have a, have a nice meal. It's cold out anyhow. We'd love you to get connected to Cornerstone. And as we do that right now, let's prepare ourselves to give back to the Lord. Lord, I pray you bless these tithes and offerings today. In Jesus' name, we pray you multiply the blessings upon everyone that gives. We thank you that you are our source of blessing. And for those of you that are, are, are guests here today, don't feel obligated to give. Go ahead, let's do that. A couple other things I want to mention to you is that we have, uh, every week we have something called 10 Steps Closer to Christ. We will help you in the beginning stages of your life in Christ at 9 o'clock, right in the conference room as well. We want to encourage you to get involved with small groups. We want to encourage you that God has good things for you. You're not here by accident. You, okay, everybody? God bless you, and we're so glad that, that God shows us the way. Let's all stand if we could as they're continuing to, and let's have a concluding song. As we're doing that, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. If you need prayer, sometimes you need someone to come alongside and say, I'll pray with you. Power of agreement. Maybe you need that this morning. I'll encourage you to come forward and, and, and do that if you need prayer. Let's just conclude with a final song as we do that. The prayer team can come up.